First, thank you everyone for coming down to listen to us talk. Hopefully we don't bore you too much. We've had a couple of wines, so hopefully we'll be on fine form. Um, I guess tonight we're just going to talk about how it all came about, um, the process we went through to get to the start line, because that's always, as we all know, that's the hardest part when you're doing an ocean race of any sort, is to get into the start line. Um, things we learnt, things we wish we'd known, and that's about it, isn't it? Anything else you want to add? I just, the owner of the boat's just going to the bar, he's just don't come in. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I'll start with how it started. It was two years ago in Winter Series. Um, the boat I usually raced on wasn't racing, so I went out with Campbell. I've known Campbell for 20 years. We actually did our first commercial ticket at TAFE together back in 2002 when we got our Coxswain's ticket. And Campbell was actually the person who nicknamed me Wendo all those years ago. You can um, never get Wendy on a boat. You're like, Wendo, cover us up. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I've just got to do I'm them, and I'm going with them, and I've said, oh, and there's that <laughs> guy, and then, that, oh, and there's a women's crew that I've been trying. Oh. And to actually get on the boat was a minor miracle. Okay, so anyway, that's not true. But, so I did a winner series, and that's when it had just been announced. So it must have been 2020, Pick I think. a number. Yeah, yeah. No, who knows? All these COVID years have blended. Um, and we are just standing down the back of the boat after the race, talking about how awesome it is that the CYC is now having a two-handed division. Wouldn't it be great to do that? And we both sort of were like, I'd love to, but we need to find a boat. And it was actually Colin. Give us a wave, Colin, down the back there. Colin just looked at us as if we were both really dumb, saying, you know, you're actually standing on a boat, what about this one? <laughs> and that's and that's how it started, which was a great idea to take a boat that's never raced offshore since they've had it for, what, 10, 12 years? About 12 years. Yeah, about 12 years. It's never raced offshore for 12 years and turned that into an ocean racing boat. Little did we know how much work we had to do. Which is what we're going to talk about, I reckon. Yeah, um, so firstly, my notes, we are obviously the reason the CYC wouldn't let two-handers as part of the whole thing. Wendo and I announced that we were sailing, we walked down a arm and we saw the fear. <laughs> Griffo just panicked. Hello Griffo. Um, oh there you are, hello mate. Griffo panicked, decided to put in water ballast. Um, but we, um, we sort of had this starting point and then we started making lists of what we would need to do. And that original list and my original $30,000 budget were ridiculous and... I never saw we, it. We would never, have, we would never have agreed to it if we had of known, but... I'm I never saw a $30,000 budget. Yeah, the no. first budget I saw was more like a hundred. Because um, everything about what we've done is compromise, right? Um, I would have been lovely to have walked into the JPK yards or... Um, into a into Geno dealer and say, Lee, can I please have a brand new uh, Sunfast 3300 with all the sales? Uh, however, we didn't really have that sort of budget. We didn't have any budget. So the first thing we did was we sort of put a little pack together to try and get some sponsorship. Um, we got a random phone call from our good friend Duncan at QMC who was like, we're going to get you uniforms. And I was like, that's great. We don't need uniforms. We need rigging. So we knew we were we always going to look really good. We are the best now. dressed crew. <laughs> we got to Hobart and Pete Frankie was like, how come you guys are so well dressed always? It's like, because of the QMC sponsorship. We don't have a code zero. We don't have new head sales, <laughs> but damn, we look good. <laughs> but we're very, very happy that we did get clothing and when we were gigs. And know. they've been they've been amazing and they've helped, helped yeah. us and, and helped us get to the next level and get to the... When we did get sponsors, we were able to put their names on our shirts and off we went. This is us uh, in the Derwent. We've been parked for about 10 hours before this and to be moving was fantastic. And you'll see how gentle the breeze is and how lovely it is. We Which actually had tunes pumping then. We've got no shoes on, the sun's shining. We've got the music blaring. We're having a fabulous time because the boat started moving. And about 20 minutes, let's see how close we are to Hobart. 20 minutes later, at the end, we'll show you a, this is not then. We'll show you a video of <laughs> us finishing. And that breeze came in like you would not believe. This is first afternoon, I believe. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm in bed. If Most of these shots window drives because I sleep a lot. He does. He gets a golden pillow out of the two of us. Um, but I, I guess we're just showing this to, to reaffirm that we actually got there. As we all know, the 2020 Hobart got cancelled. Look, we were devastated. We'd done a lot of fundraising. We did a lot of prep for the boat. But looking back now with hindsight, and we'll talk about the reasons why, it would have just been a delivery for us. So I reckon if we had the conditions we had on the first night in the, this race, 
our mane would have shredded and we would have just been turned around, tail between our legs going home. So even though we were bitterly disappointed back in 2020, um, it turned out to be the best thing for us. So starting with, where do you want to start with major changes that we did? So we'll start with what we changed, what we could afford to change in the first year. Yep. And then the second year when we got a bit more sponsorship dollars, what we changed as we went along. And we don't know who this dude is. He's just some random dude. <laughs> but it's what we did. We actually did this for the first, we did this the second time, for the second go. With the boat, the, so let's just quickly talk about the boat. Uh, Beneteau first 34.7, it's 32 feet long because the French can't count. Um, in America they called it a 10R, which makes lots more sense because it's 10 metres long. Um, they were built uh, by Beneteau. The first, obviously, is a pretty prestigious line and first have always been a really great cruiser racer compromise. Um, we all know that the 44.7 and the 40.7 have won before. Again, Bruce Farr design, that lovely far, think of the far foddy hull shape with the tuck stern. Um, it's a really gorgeous boat. However, they were specced for the med as a sort of med racer and they put a, lot, a really small runner on it which, was, which is fantastic in light air. However, in over sort of 15 knots, it becomes more than a handful. And in a two-handed situation, it's pretty much undrivable. Um, you downwind, downwind in 25 knots with a kite up, you, you just spin out within 30 seconds. So uh, Colin, bless him, went all right and brought a new rudder for us. And I think that's the single biggest change we made to the boat which made us go fast and made us made us in control of the boat um, and this is some bloke with a beanie holding the two rudders so you can see it's a pretty significant change um, the next thing was we didn't have a main we had a um a string a carbon string main that's about 10 years old uh, we then dad kept saying oh, i've got a delivery main and we finally dragged it out and it turned out to actually be quite a nice north offshore main, but again from 2006. And we spent quite a bit of money converting that to cars. Um, yeah, can I just jump in here? Sure. So the reason, um, I don't know if you guys you know the Beneteau 34.7, it has bolt rope the whole way up the left of the sail, which means if you're going to put a reef in, when you're racing around the harbour, you put a reef in before you go out, no big deal. If you're going to shake it out, yeah, you've got a full crew. If you're going to try and put a reef in when you're offshore with a bolt rope, it's, it's bloody difficult. And then it's more hard, it's, that's not a word, it's, it's difficult to get it out as well. So we changed cars. So we had cars up to the first, the last reef point. So we could actually keep the cars on the track, get a reef in, bolt rope the rest of the way because we couldn't afford to change it and there was no need to. So we made that combination of cars and bolt rope. So it was a lot easier to shake a reef in and out because with us, we'll talk about head sails in a second, that was going to be our major change when we got overpowered, was putting reefs in and out, which we needed to do quickly, which we learned how to do really quickly. Next thing we did is take the foil off. Oh, first we, we went to Jason Newhouse at um, Diverse Rigging, who was fantastic, and had the rod rigging changed. The rod rigging was original, and I don't think the boat was insured to go outside the heads. So obviously, 10 years, you've got to change your rod rigging. So we did the rod rigging. We did most of the cordage on the boat. On the boat. Um, and we, well, Jason curled up the foil and the foil overnight just split in half. So that was the end of the foil. But we then went to Hank's on the jibs, which actually wasn't as major a thing as we thought it was going to be, but we ended up getting all of our jibs hanked. Yeah, so another reason why we decided hanks would work for us as well, when you're shorthand, if, you have, if we're sailing up wind and we have a man overboard, and safety is pretty important, as we all know, the first thing we're going to do is hove to, and that means the person who's off watch will come up on deck and just smoke down that halyard. And if you've got a hanked on sail, there's a bigger chance it's just going to smash down onto the deck. Whereas if you've got it in a foil, you've got to go on the foredeck, pull the sail down. So part of the safety was, you know, if Campbell had fallen over, because it's always called a man overboard, so it'd be him that's going, not me. Um, I could come up, smoke the halyard down, and we always had them on the winch ready. So whenever, whatever head sail we had up the front, kite or whatever, is always on the winch. So the jam is ready to just smoke it and lose it. Um, and it would just come down the foredeck. And so that's time to get it down quicker, to get back to pick up the fill that's fallen overboard. There are two hundred people that don't do that, yeah. and I, it's insane for mine. Obviously, you, you take a performance loss, but 
It's just it's a no-brainer. But, but to cre uh, Campbell's cre though, credit, he smoked at changing head sales. So for us to change a head sale became a really good decision. We talked about the weather, we talked about what was coming, what was past, what's going to happen. So for us to change a head sale was a huge big decision. Um, but he managed, he got it down pretty quick. I never timed him because Campbell's always he's younger than me. He's always going to go up the front. But there is a way you can hang on the new sale. So you, hang, you take off the tack, hang on the new sale, drop it as it comes down and hank it. So you can do that change really quick. And that's something we do on the clipper boats. You know, we're doing that on a 70 footer because Sir Robin Knox Johnson likes everyone to work hard. So that's something I'd learned in the past of how to do a quick hanked on head sail change, which works really well. For people taking notes, the things I would change, so with somebody younger and fitter than you. <laughs> I'm fitter than you. Oh, I know you are, but you're not going to the bow, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, I hate done head tools, yeah. So we had this we had this main that wasn't amazing, but it was alright. And off we went and chugged along. So we we yeah. at this stage we've changed the rod. We've changed oh, we went and talked to Matt, uh, who we called Dr. Evil for reasons I can't even remember. Matt What's Smith that? from um, Electric. Yep. And he went and talked to B he and Guy went and talked to B and G. And uh, B and G helped us out with a Triton 2 system. Uh, previously, we had a an old Raymarine, I can't think what it was called, but it's a um, really solar up. panel, solar powered thing that never really works. Tactic. Tactic. Um, we've got one, I've got, it's sitting in the shed if anyone wants to buy one. Um, change that out. They We put in a Triton 2 system uh, with a couple of just, we just had two screens in the cockpit and an autopilot. Uh, quite important to tool handed sailing, an autopilot is kind of a key <laughs> part of the program. Uh, before we had an autopilot, our good friend Ollie Gill, who I've sailed, who we both sailed with a lot, came out and he was the autopilot while we trained, which was fantastic. And we call our autopilot Ollie as a result. Yeah, which is pretty cool. So the bigger cha the big changes there, this is over the two year period as well. So if we went to Hobart in 2020, if that had happened, we would have had the old main sail that would have shredded, we didn't have the instruments, we hadn't changed the instruments in the cockpit, so we didn't have a chart plotter in the cockpit, which became so important. Yeah. Um, we just else? had two screens, but we, yeah. I think after blue water, we, yeah. after I think this, the second last race, probably not, maybe it was Cabbage Tree Blue Water, yeah. we suddenly realised that we were sort of running phones on deck and we had a chart plotter downstairs and the running up and down and looking at phones, it, never really worked. We put Could in a V and G Triton 2 screen, which was only about thirteen hundred dollars, which in the scheme of things was not a major and it was a bit of a game changer for us. I think it, um, we really realised that we needed something on deck was in that first blue water series leading up to the Hobart that wasn't a Hobart that never happened was when we went, I don't know if anyone here did it, when you had to go around the virtual marks. So to try, and one was a kite drop then or hoist, I think it was a drop, I can't even remember now. So we were coming around a virtual mark I'm in the companion way, trying to see down below on a tiny chart. But I go, yeah, I think we're around it. We can drop the kite. And then when I went down after we'd done all the manoeuvres, it's like, yeah, no, we didn't actually quite do it properly. We've got to circle back round, you know. So, and I'd race around the virtual marks a lot in Clipper. We a lot of the times we'd also race, race around the world, but you couldn't find a virtual mark. I'm yeah, like, no, yeah, I, I never had the problem before. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, who knows? I'm like, when the, how did you get around Cape Point? She's like, oh, just on the left. There's a big thing yeah. there. There's a thing there. If you're going to hit it, you're going to hit it. It's not like this invisible mark. <laughs> hey, guys, something we didn't oh, yeah, say. If you've got yeah. questions, like, let's just stop us and put your hand up. Yes, yes. Mr. Henry. What sort of hanks? We have the brass piston hanks. I look at other people that have sexy clips and things. We're a budget program. We're not, we're not, not, we're not Rupert. And the thing with the piston hangs, they work fine because the sails, we're not out there for three weeks at a time, so they're not getting corroded. Because what you can do with a piston hang is drill a tiny little bit of hole in it and put a bit of spectra free, which I've done in the past, which we didn't need to do that. I didn't know that was an option. Yeah, you should do that. Well, you're the one up there. If, you were, if you were on the bow, we would have done that. Yeah, we would have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. The chart cutter on the uh, cabin top or on the binnacle? Um, no, we don't, our binnacle's really low, so it's on the cabin top, it's on the bulkhead there. Um, which is what we also used to, we needed to 
access that if we were going to... No, we didn't need to access that. It was, a chat, it was the instrument, wasn't it, when we had to OK that we are going to do a gyro attack with our instruments with the doodle? Yeah. Yeah. OK, sorry, I digress. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, we, yeah. If we had more money, we would put um, heads-up displays on the mast, which we used to have with the tactic. We've still got the bracket, but we don't have anything there. So we just have... We just have the two small Triton two readouts and the and the seven inch plotter. Again, cheapest available. But I've got to say that the cheapest B and G Triton two is pretty spectacularly good. And it was people, awesome. Yeah. Coming down Mariah Island, we were next to Rum Rebellion. Yes. And so we're having a jibe off with Rum Rebellion. And for us to we decided we wanted to bang the shore, we could actually just trust we got the, the chart plotter there, so we could go all the way in and just sit there ready for, jive, for a jive and then just jive back out again. Whereas before, we wouldn't have been able to get that close to shore confidently because you're downstairs trusting it coming back up. So it was just invaluable. And for things like AIS as well, because you've got your AIS display on there as well, so you can just sit there. Obviously, we have it on the small chart, the chart, the, sorry, the small instrument as well, but who can read that? I can't, so. Um, we, I spent, much valuable time. I got a loan of a computer with um, Expedition, and I lost a lot of time and spent a lot of time and energy trying to get the, that to work. And it was an old computer, and I bought another computer, and that broke. And at no stage did we get that working. I think our part of part of when you talk when we talk to Clogs and Jules, they had those systems working and were at the next level of. And we were really trying to get our systems working before we went south. And a part, a large part of why they won, and they are by far the, the benchmark boat in this fleet at the moment, is because they are at that level where they are logging and checking stuff, whereas we have only really now got to that level where we can mm. have the time to do that. We've now got our systems working. So big, a huge gap in preparedness, I guess, from, from them um, and... Um, we're in awe of the program they put together, uh, but money solves a lot of those problems. Um, and I know we're, we're pretty happy. I, I guess when we both started, we didn't want to go out there and make idiots of ourselves and not do well at all. So one is always to finish, but two for me, I'm pretty competitive on the water. It's like I'm not going to go out there just to compete and finish. I want to go out there and do well, not for any other reason that it's like it's just nice being at the front of the fleet. I mean, it's all, we all love being up there. So. I think when we first started sailing in the first Blue Water series leading up to how it didn't happen, we had some okay results. We were doing really well, but then because we're a smaller boat, we're always at the back of the fleet, but doing okay on handicap. By the time we get the heads, the breeze is just shut out. So we've gone from doing really well in a race to just doing crap in a race. So that was a lot of our results. And it's like, okay, we're pretty happy with that. We always saw time where we could make up time by not going around a virtual market. We actually, in fact, did go around, but we went back around it again because why not? So we saw places where we could have saved time, but that, that shut out is something we couldn't finish, we couldn't help. So the blue water previous, the, you know, that first one we did okay, we we're pretty happy. You know, we we're happy with how things were progressing. Yeah. And then the We also discovered one, our boat was competitive. Yeah, we, we were, did. Yeah. We, we kept... Yeah. We, we weren't sure how we were going to go on IRC. We knew mm. the boat, and theoretically, was a good IRC boat. But we suddenly looking, going, oh, we, we left an hour behind on that race course and we lost by an hour and 15 minutes. This is good. We can do this. Even though we were getting terrible results, but we, were, we knew why. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the lead up, the Blue Water Series to this Hobart, we were doing OK. Again, we still had our crappy old mainsail, which... We realised then, yeah, she's a bit stretched and it's doing the job. Then we had, there was a few races there. There was a fair bit of breeze on that was like, well, I don't know if we're going to make it. And it did. And then we did get sponsorship to buy us a new main. And what race was it? I can't, was it Cabbage Tree or? So we, we did a Bird know. Island race where we reached up and reached back and we were just watching this, the d lamb on the <laughs> middle of the main just flap. Mm. and just getting worse. And I was sure that as we jibed around, because it's literally reach up, reach back, which is exactly what a 30 foot, 32 foot boat does not want to do. Um, as we jibed around, I figured the bang of the jibe was going to pop the thing and we would have to motor back from the furthest point on the race course. But, and we jibed around and the whole thing was completely delaminated on the other side and it made it home. Mm. But then it was like, hi Mel, to my wife, I think we might need to spend some money on a sale. And she's like, oh good. Um, and then our good friend Alex came up with, um, he's like, oh, no, we can do that. And 
we got a new main. Next race we did was uh, Cabbage Tree, and suddenly hit. We had a. We at one stage we were 12 miles behind the boats we should have been next to, and then we sort of kept caught up, and then um, the suddenly came. We went a little bit offshore and got a little bit of a lift, but boat loved upwind, heavy air, uphill, which we hadn't picked. And um, we won the thing by quite a long time. And suddenly we're like, actually, we're better at this than we think we are. And, well, than I thought we were. Obviously, Wendy's ego is un <laughs> unchecked. <laughs> uh, uh, we're better at this than we thought we were, and off we go. So it was pretty exciting. So I'm, I'm going to change tack here. Oh, a, that's I a wonderful like pun. I love oh, it. Pun. So um, I'm just going to backtrack a bit in what we did previous. Um, Campbell Jeans, bless his cotton socks, um, he started a really cool WhatsApp group. So in that Hobart that didn't happen, there was probably about six of us that were going to compete in that. So we started a WhatsApp group, that, well, Campbell started a WhatsApp group. So we were talking about safety and training and stuff. So once that 5K circle that you weren't allowed out, dissipated we started doing some racing amongst ourselves and um the group was just so pete frankie drew and i and the guys off rum Rebe no not even no just the disco guys disco, disco. it was just the three bikes so we could go out and train next to each other yeah so we started training which was awesome because you want to see how other people are doing stuff and it also started back talking about safety so once we started that rupert was there as well we were doing a race up to bird island um, and as Campbell said, this one was just our little two-handed group. We started our own little race and we're heading up to Bird Island. It was a westerly. We're reaching up. We're going to sail for six hours up. Chuck a Yui, come back on the same point of sail. And we just looked at each other and said, do you think we're really achieving anything here? And it's like, well, no, we probably ripped the main if we're not, you know, if we're not careful. So we decided to pull out the race. We made some lame-ass excuse why we said we weren't going to carry on. But we trained doing man overboards, which to me was far more important than steering in a straight line on the same point of sail. So we were offshore in probably two to three metres of swell with 30 knots of breeze when we started doing some serious man overboard training offshore. And that's where we learned a fair bit. We were really, really surprised at how well the auto helm controlled on a course because with our auto helm, you can either put into a point of sail or a heading. At low speeds, it would hold this heading. So we're going, OK, this is how we do a man overboard. If you're gone, I can trust this auto helm to keep us going slow enough to get back to you in a controlled state. So to me, that was huge to do some MOB training. And another large reason why we put the, the screen on deck, because there's no man overboard button on deck. So two of us are on deck. Where I fall in because... I'm an idiot. Um, window doesn't have to run downstairs to hit the button to come back upstairs. So another good reason to have that on deck. Yeah, and, and something I've learned, which is not just for single hand and sailing, I've always had the track running on my chart plotter as well, because if you're sailing up wind, the first thing you're going to do is hope to. So even if the person doesn't push the MOB button correctly, you can at least see where you hove to, so you know you're in that close vicinity where you had your MOB. So that's just a little tip that you know, like keep track running. Yeah. Um, so we out of that, we went and bought some stuff. Watches some food. <laughs> Wendy on, Campbell off, Campbell on, Wendy off. That's the entire watch system. That was it. <laughs> that was me, because I'm the funny one. <laughs> Just a really important point we need to make, I'm the funny one. But I, so we I, know. Um, yeah, so we bought, the main thing, we, we bought a scramble ladder, which uh, is not going to go on any of the TP52s in the near future, because it weighs probably four or five kilograms. <laughs> We bought this scramble ladder, which was about 200 bucks, and we keep that in the cockpit locker so that when somebody goes in, we can actually have a chance getting back on deck because the biggest issue, I guess, for us was you get them in the water, but they're in the water, you get them alongside, but then what do you do? Um, we put a carabiner on a, on a loop at the base of the mast so that when you go forward to get a haggard to get the person into the boat. You've actually got a big carabiner. You can just smash on the back of their life jacket. Uh, we both have the new spin lock jackets, which have a pull when you get dragged overboard on your, on your um, what do you call it, your tether. Yeah, so uh, can I just interrupt, just in case anyone's thinking about buying new tethers, just check the Australian sailing new rules that are coming in from July next year, your, fat, your flat plate. Tethers are not going to pass safety anymore, so if you've got a big boat, you might be going out there and buying 15 new tethers. Yay! Um, but yeah, on what Campbell's talking about, on our vetoes, we both got vetoes, so if we're trapped underneath a boat or getting pulled along the side and the other person's down below, 
It actually has the quick release actually in the life jacket that you just pull this it's underneath, you pull it, and it actually opens up the clip that you're connected to the boat on, which for two hands, I think is pretty important. I bought the last one of those watches in the country, and the <laughs> idea was we were going to switch them around. Uh, there are more in now, and I really like the idea. It's a Bluetooth tether. We're carrying our phones in our pockets all the time now because our phone is our sat phone. Sat phone. So we have the Iridium Go. I always get yep. them. Iridium Go. Go. Sat phone. So the, your mobile phone, your Apple phone handset is your Iridium Go handset. So I've got that in my pocket all the time. Me too. We will, use, we will get a second watch because they're only like 150 bucks. And we're one each. When Wendy with the watch is 10 metres from me with my iPhone, the iPhone starts screaming at you. And it really is screaming at you. Very, very loud. And I've tried over the years. I've, I've had a couple of these sort of systems and they've never really worked well. This is the first one I think that works really well. So I do sort of recommend. I, we haven't used it because we only had one watch. I wore it. And may, Wendy might have had the app on, but I'm not sure. Um, but I didn't pull over the board, so we don't know. Yeah. So we had the watch that Campbell wore. He never gave it to me, which was a bit worrying. I did, anyway. actually. Well, I never wore it anyway. Well, but with, with, the ladder, with, the, with the ladder, you can see old mates climbing up the side there, which is a bit, it's never going to happen on a yacht. You're not going to use to climb up. So we had this set up, getting back to the Caribbean and the Howard, that we had it set up in the cockpit locker with a couple of carabiners to attach it to the boat. So there was two options we had. We could either, if, if whoever went over was conscious, we could actually flow it out, uh, sorry, deploy it out the back of the boat. So you could actually use that to scramble up the back because you're never going to climb up like that. We also have the swim ladder on the back that you just smash yeah, down. Yeah, so we had a swim ladder as well. So that's if you could get up on the boat, and that's going to try and keep you away from the boat going like this up and down, which is the biggest fear if you're going to get on the back of the transom on a boat. But our boat is quite small, so it's quite low, so it's OK. Um, and the other way is we had it so you could actually attach a howie to it. So Because the biggest worry is if the other person went over and they're unconscious, how are you going to get an unconscious person back? It's okay on a fully crewed boat, you send someone else over on a halyard with a hook, pull them up and pull them up on another halyard. Um, here, we'd have to try and manoeuvre the person into this, this ladder laying in the water with a halyard attached to it, then grind them up on the halyard. So at least you're getting them up near the top side. So the more, the more time you spend thinking about <laughs> man over wood recovery two up, the less likely you are to go two-handed mm. sailing. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it is genuinely keeps you awake while you're in your bunk. It's, yeah, well, that, that's yeah. probably the biggest scariest thing is how do you get that person back and, you know. We don't have an answer. Yeah, we tried everything and we just decided to stay on the boat. It's going to be the yeah. easiest way, so. So but, I'm going to have to pee off the, I'm going to have to yeah. pee off the back of the boat, um, which, which Wendy said, when she first said it, I was like, that's ridiculous. And then she, then I thought about it and went, you know what, it actually makes a lot of sense. There's a perfectly good toilet downstairs, go and use it. Mm -hmm. um, don't stand at the back of the boat and have a rogue wave throw you in because you're going to feel so stupid as the boat sails away from you. Yeah, and so we, we had um, jack stays everywhere. We had jack stays across the back of the boat, the normal jack stays you'd have. So there was no time when you're on deck you shouldn't have been un unhooked. And, yeah, I agree with Cam. I've sailed on some fast boats over the years. It's like, do you really want to be tethered onto a boat that's doing 20 knots downwind and you go over the side? But two-handed, you don't have that choice. You know, you've got to... You, it's, Speedwell yeah. did, did 30 knots once. It was on a truck. It was on a truck coming from the factory. <laughs> 16 um, and a half knots with our top speed on Hobart. Well, 16.9, yes. sorry. Um, and that was scary, but Dad was quite impressed. Just other changes, because everyone always asks about food. So with our watches, everyone asks when you're two-handed about your watches. Because I hate to say this, but for me, a Hobart is, is quite a short race. Um, it's, it takes me a while to get into a proper watch system. So we just went into the system of if you're knackered, go down and sleep. If you're on watch and you're not that tired, stay awake. But you always have to think of the weather as well. So if we knew there was bad stuff coming, obviously you've got to go get some sleep when you're not tired because you're going to need it later. That first night and mm. the blue, the cabbage tree that we did well in, we sort of did about an hour, hour and a half on and off. Yeah. And that worked really well for us. It sort of kept you fresh, kept you driving. Um, as an aside, but it's all related. When we talked to the, the gentleman who did the very, very comprehensive review of, of two-handed sailing and delivered their report, the, the, one of the things they asked was, what percentage of the time did you use your autopilot? And our answer is probably 5 to 10%, if that. We're hand steering pretty much the whole way. And I think David Kellett said that, and he probably won't like me saying this, he's like, 
the further back down the fleet the boats oh, were, the more they used their autopilot. Shipwake. Sorry? Shipwake. Oh, shipwake said that. Mm. Okay. Either way, mm. point being, autopilots are great in driving the boat in a straight line for a limited period of time while you adjust something, but nothing's anywhere near as quick as a, as a person steering, especially not Wendy Tuck, who apparently has some experience. Just a little. Um, I think with two hand as well, um, with two hand, I think you get so tired that when you do go down to sleep, you actually, you're asleep before your head hits the pillow. Like sailing on fully crude and stuff, a lot of the time, the first night you don't sleep because you're excited and blah, 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 blah. But um, I, I personally found with me, on the first night, I'd be asleep straight away and sleep so deeply that after an hour and a half, I don't know, you guys, when you sail on a fully crewed, you're off for four hours during the day, maybe three hours at night. After an hour and a half, you just lay in your bunk gun. Yep, okay, got to lay here and rest. Whereas us, we'd go, okay, I'm awake. I'm going to go up on deck. You go sleep now, which it just worked really well for us. And that, and that time frame, that hour and a half, wasn't it was sort of organic. It wasn't all oh, like... She's been down for 90 minutes. Let's get her up. Yeah. It just seemed to work for us. Yeah. Um, Food-wise, um, Mel did a huge amount of cooking in the Mel's couple of days. Up, oh, Mel's my wife. Sorry. <laughs> um, did a huge amount of cooking in the couple of days before. Um, Wendy, being vegetarian, just so annoying. <laughs> um, no, no. We but made all this, and we um, we had a jet boil on board. We sorry, we put a jet boil on board because it's so much easier just to. Prep, prep, and we were sort of banging. Um, uh, cry, uh, my, my cry friends at a restaurant. I cry, we cry back to a whole lot of food, but we honestly didn't eat as much of it as we probably thought we were going to, and ended up reverting to freeze dried because it's just so much easier and quicker to just smash the freeze dried out. Yeah, and, and that's why we had the, the um, jet boil because you only make one meal at a time. We figured it's not like a fully crewed boat where you're going to eat at watch changeover and, and everyone's going to eat at the same time. We're just going to eat when we're hungry and I, I can last for days on chocolates and chips. So, so I did. <laughs> where, yeah, Wendo doesn't eat. That's a, <laughs> my big takeaway from all of this. Wendo, not an eater. Um, but yeah, so uh, the twins the wife sailed with for a long time on the Air Baby used to do these quartermaster meals which are fantastic where you get under a little bag, you put some water in, it's got a magnesium -y thingy and it cooks itself. And they are something else we would consider using, but we didn't this time. But the freeze dried works really well. Um, you just, you literally boil it, stick, the, stick it in the sink, walk away, come back 15 minutes later, hot meal, happy days. Yeah, and another thing we were aware of, we had some charging problems, which we still haven't got to the bottom of, or have you now? We have now. The, yeah. Okay, so we we're really <coughs> conscious of we didn't know how often we're going to be, or how long we're going to be using the auto helm for, and how much we'd be charging and and fuel consumption and stuff like that, because that's why the engines on a lot charging up. So we didn't want to be running the fridge all the time. So we just to cut down on weight and energy, we froze all our water bottles. I hate saying it. We did use a lot of plastic bottles that we've recycled and we reused. Four, Wendy. Okay, four. We had four, four, <laughs> four one litre water bottles that we froze. So that worked for the fresh food that Mel had cooked and other stuff in the fridge, like chocolate ice cream that I didn't tell you about. No, just kidding. Um, so we used, we sort of recycled all that sort of stuff as well. And we were really conscious of not taking rubbish and plastic and all that sort of, so we, yeah, we had four plastic water bottles, which to me is four too many, but anyway. Um, because we didn't have a water maker on board, which, you know, if you're going to be really hardcore... Craig's like actually going to give us... Oh, no, Griffo's giving us the one off um, China's Whisper for next week. Fabulous, we're going to have a water maker next time. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Griffo. <laughs> Cheers. Um, what else, food-wise or anything? Oh, I live on up and goes. Yeah. They, they're super sugary, but they, they feed you up and they keep you, keep you up and going. So um, I, I guess having lots of little snacks as well, because I'd rather just keep grazing. So, But food's pretty normal. Food, not much different from when oh, you're fully crude. The big difference between you and me is you eat sweet and sugar and I don't. And I reckon on the, one of the first Blue Water races, Wendy came up and gave me literally half That's a right. Cadbury's chocolate thing and I ate it's it and I, and I got hyper and then I sugar crashed and it was so angry and grumpy and he I'm like, I don't know what was wrong. Pets. It was hilarious. It's like, wow, he's yelling at me and then he apologises. Oh, you didn't yell at me. But no, you didn't. Really important <laughs> thing we should quickly say is that there's an interview if you if you can be asked if you want to hear more of us speaking after this, which is unlikely. Uh, we did an interview <laughs> with um, Bow Caddy and I was two beers deep and finished the third one during the interview. But I do point out that Wendy is the most cheerful person on the planet. When it's blowing 
30 knots, you're worried that the rig's going to stay in the boat, the sea's unpleasant, you can't see a thing and you're, you're exha exhausted anyhow. Wendy pops up, she's like, let's go, well, let's go. Hey, this is great. Yeah, we're well, okay. Yeah, we're good. And you're like, oh, God, I want to kill you at the moment. And she takes over the helm. I go to bed, I come back up and I'm like, are you all right? And she's like, yeah, oh, this is so good. And you're like, like three days later, oh, I'm having so much fun. I'm like, Wendy, I'm, I'm exhausted and I'm stressed. Oh, Jesus, oh, I'm loving this. She's so positive all the time. You can't help but be in, totally. imbued with the positivity. Um, and I, despite what Craig said earlier, am not the most positive person ever. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I lifted. You lift. You lifted me a lot, and it's amazing how much of a difference having someone who's just constantly enjoying what you're doing. Like we're out there to have fun, right? Is the theory. You get to the end, and you're like. What were we thinking? That wasn't fun. Oh, um, it, it was. was fun. It was heaps no, of fun. No, can I just jump in? It's horribly fun. It's so much fun two-handed. It just, it's, it's hard to describe the difference from two-handed and, and fully crewed. I guess you're relying on your co-skipper so much, and I trust Campbell with my life, otherwise I wouldn't have sailed with him. Ooh, and, yeah, we hard. are very different. Um, I trust Campbell's judgment. He made some calls that were different from what we agreed with, but when he explained why he did that, it's like, that's the perfect thing. That is the perfect decision that you made. You kept us in that race. If you hadn't, we would have pulled out in the first night. The, the first night, when it was a bit gnarly, we had the number three up. We were going to go to our third reef, and we thought, oh, why bother with the third reef? Let's get the main down. So we actually got the main all the way down and sailed for about an hour and a half, two hours, which is the number three up. We were still doing seven knots, which on a little tiny 10-metre boat, that's pretty fast upwind. We didn't want any more speed because we didn't want to crash off waves and break. And we're on a Beneteau, you know, it's, it's a Beneteau, it's got furniture. And we decided we're going to keep going out. We're going to keep going out. I went off watch. When I woke up, we tacked. And I said, Campbell, I thought we were going to keep going. And his call was, we'll get into boat breaking, boat breaking territory. Um, and it was the right decision, you know. If we kept going, we would have broken shit and we would have pulled out. So that's... Which I totally disagree with. I really no. wish I had have kept mm. going. No. Um, because um, the two boats that were ahead of us in the finish were the kept going. And in, yeah, a, in a race that took us five days and one hour, a decision we made 11 hours in actually was the decisive one, which is pretty frustrating. But but at yeah, the time, and in an interview afterwards, I said, not my boat. It's it's Colin's boat. Mm. And unfortunately, he couldn't come to Hobart because my mum was ill. Um, but I had all these plans just to give him the keys of the boat in Hobart and say, thanks, mate. See you later. Except I broke the key. <laughs> you did break the key. <laughs> we, um, that's the, that's we, the only thing we broke was the key. Well, we're, in, we're in... Um, uh, Storm Bay, and the literally when he broke the float on the key, and I said, and I sent a message to my dad and my wife saying, "Oh my God, major failure. We may have to pull out," and sent that, and the <coughs> photo didn't send. <laughs> didn't go down well. No, it didn't, did it? <laughs> didn't go down well. Hey, yeah. Oh, the doodah. Oh, the doodah. The doodah. That's not how you spell do that, by the way. It is so Does everyone agree it's D double O? Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. I named it, that's how I spell it. So the Duda, as you can see on the left here, Campbell's wearing it around his neck. I'm wearing it in that photo with an elastic around our neck then around our chest as well. So if you were gonna be on deck by yourself, you had to have the doodah on because that's how we can control attack, we can come up and come down. So if you're on deck and you do fall overboard by yourself, the best thing you can do is just take it off, put it into the standby so you go head to wind or something bad happens, which is going to wake the other person up. Because I never had the watch. He reckons he gave it to me. I never, never had it. So that, was, that became really important, and that's what we'd use to tack and jibe as well. And do you reckon that every time we switch watches, we would hand it over? <laughs> no chance. So you'd, you'd get there, the you'd be bashing. down, you'd close your eyes, and you hear this bang, bang, bang. Give me the doona! I need the doona! Give me the doona! <laughs> oh, Jesus. And we only call it the doodah because we still don't know what its official name is. <laughs> we don't know what it's called. Yeah, remote control, doodah. No, it's not, doodah. It's not the, doodah. For the TV. We have a TV remote control. That's, <laughs> we, that's the first, you come off watch, you give the remote control for the TV. That's so you can stay and watch Bluey. Yeah, so it's, um, and I think it was actually Rupert Bluey. Henry who said, you know, what the, what the French do is put the other bit of bungee, so you've got the bit of bungee around your neck and then the other bit that goes around your chest, so it stays here. And then you know which way it's sitting, so you know how to use it, because that's what we use to tack and jive. So, um, don't talk for a jive.
We can talk through a jive. Um, a heavy wing jive. A heavy air jive. <laughs> oh, let's talk, we'll just quickly talk about sales. Um, so we brought, we brought this fantastic main from um, Ben De Costa and Pete at Hood helped us with a main. Um, we, this amazing woman called Sue, wandered up to Wendy very early in the piece and said, I'll buy you a spinnaker. Mm. And she did. Um, and Ben made us a compromise spinnaker. So, so when we started, we had, uh, Dad had bought a number three about three years ago, the heavy air number three from Quantum, Matt Pierce had made for us. Uh, and then we had a heavier J2, sorry, it's, it's a J1 really, so it's an overlapping Gen Genoa that was from North, which was a, re which was a really lovely sale. Um, and then there was, an, there was a J4 that had been sitting in the shed that no one had ever had up that turned out to be really nice. So we, that was our sale inventory done. And we had storm sails. They'd come with the boat. Again, had never been in the air. We had this, all these theories about using the, the storm jib as a, like a staysail. And we put it up and realised it was like a metre by a metre. It was the littlest. It was like the most pathetic thing ever. At one stage, yeah, Lindsay Stead from Boat Tech came in and uh, built us a, a pad eye on the fore deck so we could run a baby stay. And we had, again, dreams about having, you know, little... Um, storm, um, not a storm star, like a staysail. We we have the pad eye, we just don't have the funds to buy the staysail. Um, one day we'll get a staysail. Um, and there's a lot of talk about how you manoeuvre when you're bareheaded and, and maintaining power while you're bareheaded and doing sail changes. And I reckon the first couple of races I would have done 15 odd sail changes where you're like, oh, let's, let's, we're down three knots, let's go change it. And by the last couple of races, you're just hanging on to sails for far longer than their windows. And oh. I know um, um, North are now selling a fantastic new technology that Griffo will give us a lecture on later uh, that, that gives him another two knots either side of his window. And that, to me, is really interesting and exciting because they're now saying that they can give you that much more depth and control over your sail. For, for us, that's, that's mana because mm. if, you can, if, you can, if you have a sail that'll go from eight knots to 16 knots instead of from 10 knots to 14 knots, that's for two-hander, that's huge. Um, that's we've talked a lot about, we've, we've talked and fantasized about um, reefing jibs. Um, no one's given me, no one, no sail maker is like, great idea, let's do it. They're always like, mm. But it might be something we look at in the future because again, we're, we're a compromise program oh, where if we can afford one sail, yeah. A J2 that turns into a J3 and a half actually sounds like a pretty attractive option for us. You're waffling. I am waffling, sorry. Mm. Uh, oh, so we ended up with one spinnaker. That was the point. When we, when we started, we had two S2s, an A3 and an A2, all of which were very old. We got this A4, and that's really our one and only kite, and it does everything, and it's been amazing. So we're just going to... a Sorry, it's a little bit of a long video. You might have said, I don't know, but it's awesome. So when we put this kite up, we've got a bit of breeze on here, so this is going up the dirt to the finish, but when we put this kite up, we had 10 knots of breeze, maybe less. So you can see we've both got no shoes on. We've got shorts and T-shirts on. We actually had the music pumping. And it was a beautiful sail with 10 knots. We were finally moving. And it had been a long, long night where we just we just got smashed going up to, uh, across Storm Bay. That's where we where we lost out a lot. Well, we didn't get smashed. There was no wind. Yeah, we, we didn't get smashed. Literally we got smashed ran out on there. handicap. <laughs> we got smashed on raining. Um, so we were quite happy when we started moving again. It was just that wonderful time when you just, the sun's up, it's warm. We're having a beautiful sail. And we've done a few jibes and it's all good. And we'll talk about our jibing manoeuvres because our our auto helm doesn't handle a lot of breeze really well. In fact, it just doesn't. That's why we steered so much. So we started off really fun, having fun. Then after we started, got in, we got into the Derwin and when we've run Rebellion and we're both charging up the Derwin, it's like, going for another drive. It's like, hey, Campbell, do you think we should just turn the tunes off this time? We might need to concentrate a bit. So that Can was I the first step. Point out, we didn't on. have the tunes on at any stage during the race until the last morning when we were like, it's all over. And we put them on for a half an hour. Yeah, and it was Campbell's playlist, which was, it was A's playlist, it was okay, it was fun. <laughs> and then, so we put this kite up in 10 knots, and, and now we've probably got 25 knots of breeze, and we've got a bit on. <laughs> we've got a bit on, there's Rum Rebellion over there. They, they were quite under control here, because um, I think I mentioned it earlier, we were doing a jiving match with them the day before down Mariah Island. They actually ripped their large masthead kite, so they've got a fractional up there. We've got the only kite we've got, which is a fractional, and it's huge. 
So we had we had a bit on. It was pretty exciting. Cam we yelled at me because when Nick Douglas, who's filming, turned up, I waved and said, "Hey, Nick, how you going?" And Cam was like, "Just concentrate now." It's like, yeah, that's me concentrating, waving. So um, it was pretty cool. Do you want to say anything? We bow down all the time. <laughs> Oh, it's and we've got nothing in the bow at all. And um, at some stage here, you'll see I'll let the van go because it's like we're in trouble here. So we, our very good friends, Drew and Pete, who are at the back, we beat on IRC by 15 minutes. And if we hadn't have kept, the, if we had have dropped this when we should have dropped it, we probably wouldn't have got them. But we are trying really hard, <laughs> trying really hard to lay like, the finish line. And and I'm like. I actually thought they had us on toast, so I was like, we have to just push and push and push. And the trouble is what happened, I'll, I'll talk through the jive then, so I'm on the helm here, and when it's heavy like this, you have to steer, you can't not hand steer. And the boat's not up, set up for two-handed, so it's a bit tricky, you can't just steer from the side and be ready to jump in the cockpit. So when we're gonna do the helm, when we're gonna jive, first step is I push the two up, the doodah, we all know the doodah, I push jive, because it knows we're downwind, so it goes jive. Then Campbell has to reach into the instrument, the, the bulkhead where he's sitting, and acknowledge that we're going to jive. Then as soon as the boat starts to turn, I jump forward, take the working sheet, the current working sheet off him, the boat starts turning, I smoke off the sheet, he pulls on the new sheet, I chuck the main over, jump back on the helm and put it back on order as standby. And if we don't do that, it all goes cactus. So what happened? We did it a little bit slower last time. So coming into the finish line, we jive too late, so we were hot. So that whole leg, we're just constantly talking. It's like, okay, I can come up. I can come up now. Come up. Oh, no, I've got to come away. And you can see you get the death wobbles right here. And it was just continual talking that whole way and then talking about how we're going to drop the damn thing before we crash into the seawall at the end of the runway. So we had a bit on. It was pretty exciting. Um, one thing we did, we, our, our kite sheets ended up about six or seven metres longer than they were originally we, um, <laughs> because you needed to be able to set up for a let As soon as the kite goes in the air, you need to set up for a letterbox. So we're going to a snatch block on the opposite side of the boat. So you need all this extra thing because what the boat really needs is lots more string hanging around in the cockpit because <laughs> that's always useful. So as soon as the kite's up, the first move is you go into the letterbox because again, I, f I fall over and we got the kite up when he has to have some way of getting the damn thing down. And the drop's actually, I'm, I'm very proud of that drop. But we, our drop technique is, yeah, smoke it, smoke the tack line, get it under control, and then that it goes. So different to how you do it in every other boat when you fully crew. <laughs> um, and we did, I don't know, did anyone watch the start of the Hover? Please say no. Don't. Did, did anyone don't see us at the start of the Hover? No, <laughs> oh, yeah, there's always one, isn't there? Um, what we learned, our start was atrocious. Although our start was good, then it just went pear shaped We had the worst drop. We got the kite up. The pole wasn't locked in, so the pole came back. So we got the extended pole there, the product. It wasn't locked in, so we got the kite at the front of the boat. Of course, it's not in a set because you got all the back wind off the main. Rally, rally, rally. So it's like get the kite down, and we both got in that panic stage. Instead of just doing our normal procedures, it just went pear shaped, and we end up fishing with the kite and behind the boat, and we're not even out the heads yet. So we're not even past our big reef yet. <laughs> And I think that was the biggest learning curve for us. It's unfortunate it was at the start of the Hobart, and luckily there was only a couple of people here that saw it. We got the kite in the water, and I think the biggest thing for both of us was like, okay, that was a major, major stuff up. But we've still got 600 and however long the race is. Nine. 609, well, no more than that. It was 600 and whatever miles to still go. So you had to, yeah, thank you, had to let that go and go, yeah, that was a major. Let's hope that's our only major, and it was. Because um, then we just went back to every manoeuvre. You've got to have how you're going to do it, who's going to do what, and you've got to stick to it. Because if you don't, that's when it goes pear shaped. So on this leg, we're not only talking about, okay, I'm getting the death wobbles here, trim on, trim on, go, ease, whatever. We talked about the drop. Even though we knew what to do and whose job was what to do during the, jo the drop, we talked about it so for so long. Every time we had a spare second, it's like, okay, let's just talk about this again. What are we going to do? Planning ahead is everything for us. Mm. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it has to be, yep, question. We talked about a sock yeah. with Greeny who wanted to sell us a sock and then everyone was sort of, the general consensus was if you, if you know how to do it properly, you don't need one. And I mean, by the end of this, we knew how to do it properly, right? Um, and the one we stuffed up in the harbour was because we didn't follow the, didn't follow the, um, the rules. Do? 
And yeah, I think, and being such a small boat, a small kite, it takes you one second to pack it. So we could drop, like I've used the sock when I did the art bus a couple of years ago on a 50 footer. Yeah, they're great when they work. Um, at night, you can always get it twisted and stuff. So yeah, we were fine without it. Kite's 100 square metres, so it's not massive. Mm. It's massive compared to the 80 squares we were running before, but it's, it's not ridiculous. And so now we've got our, when our technique's right, and we, and we, drive, we drive deep and we go A, B, C, we're all good. Jules? Um, I've got a couple of things that I haven't said, if that's all right, and then we'll do some questions. Um, my big thing is that everyone in this community of this club helped us. So many people yeah. just turned up. Um, the last two weeks before we before the race, we put the boat in the pond, and Colin just turned up every day and fixed some little thing we didn't know was, was wrong, and it was amazing. And Philby kept turning up and going, what am I doing now? And he'd fix it. And the, the pair of them were amazing. Or he'd just turn up and say, I think you need to do this and just do it. And it's like, oh, that's awesome. Um, Carl, Carl and um, Carl Garavan looked after our winches. Phil King landed, just went, went Wendy and HF Radio. Yeah. Which has an off button, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. The team, the Yoti guys, lent us money. Uh, Bo, lent us money, gave it, helped us out with sponsorship. Lindsay from Botech, I mentioned before, was a good mate. He just came and just put a pad on in for us. Holly Gill came and drove the boat. David Kellett helped us with a mast out and the measure, did the measurements for us without any question. Damien Parks lent us a life after the sat phone for a year. Um, and we, we had a fundraiser that first year when the race didn't happen. Yes, we haven't talked about it. Yeah, so we had a fundraiser where we got given a lot of stuff that we could auction off and that was huge for us. We raised 12 grand. Um, just down at Ransa, um, because nothing else was open and we could have people there. So that was huge for us. So just a fundraiser and we had Neil Burling come down. If anyone knows him off Baltic Lady, he's hilarious. He's, he's the, the greatest auctioneer, auctioneer ever. He, he reckon he made us awesome. two grand by, by just by being exciting. Yeah, so we, we, I think for us, it was the help we got is just extraordinary. So we had the two hand group, which Pete and Drew were down the back and you know, so which was awesome. And we still and that that two hand group now is massive. So anyone who's thinking about doing two hand and racing, just go, and, go and see Pete. Pete can put you in the Yeah, WhatsApp we're, we're all can you can sign up. We don't care, it's not a private group, it's just Don't try and sell a boat on it. Yeah, don't try and sell a boat. Um, but we, we're using that like for instance um, who was it that had problem with the HF? And out of the group, someone can say, oh, I know what you need to do to fix your HF. Yeah, Carlos, was it? Carlos had a whole thing with HF yeah. and people were like, oh, well, if you just sold this onto the board, He put a picture of the Yeah, just sold to this. This is what you need to do. And so it's awesome. It's but it's constantly full of intelligent chat. Very yeah, little of which I can follow. Yeah. It's like we have a secret conversation. You know what they're talking about? Yeah. So it's, and I think if you think about doing the two-handed, that to me is the best thing, is this camaraderie we have. Like you, you've been, we've been on a boat together for a long time and we don't see each other much anyhow, but we still don't want to go drinking with each other. So you hang out with all the other two-handed people, you know? So it's really cool. It's a really nice And, it, and they all feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs>eight hours of my life. I had, a I had a meltdown and I came up and Wendo just went, just go to bed. <laughs> and she was right and she was amazing. She kept the boat racing even though we were doing Cute. half a knot backwards. And I, I, needed, <laughs> I, needed, to, I needed to go to bed. <coughs> and she was great and she sent me to bed. Um, we overcated, probably less, oh. less pre-cooked food and more freeze-dried in case. Um, the on-off switch for the HF, Wendo. <laughs> Okay, I, I, if I stuff, I like to tell people. So you heard we borrowed a HF of a friend, and that was two years ago we got it installed and learned everything about it, righty, righty, right. So the, I was always going to do the radio skit, so the first day I go down and do the skit, can't get the HF working, and, I'm, and it was pretty rough and horrible, crawling around the builders trying to follow wires everywhere. Um, sent a message through by sat phone saying, look, I've got a problem with it. When it calms down, I'll figure out what it is. I think it was Campbell the next day said, oh, there's a switch on the tuner. <laughs> so, yeah, there was one switch on the tuner that I didn't see. Mm. Very embarrassing. But anyway, I'll always tell when I stuff up. Uh, Denali, pub, Denali pub shuts at 9 o'clock if you're going through Denali Canal. <laughs> we phoned on ahead. We phoned ahead. Oh, it was 8 o'clock, sorry, Kate. 8 o'clock. We phoned ahead. They, we ordered the chicken schnitties. They had them under the heat lamp for us and a bottle of red ready when we got there. 
Things we didn't know is there is a bakery in Denali, and if we had got up the next morning and gone to the bakery, we could have had like coffee and. Sort of but we saw that as we went through the canal, going, "Oh man, there goes a bakery." <laughs> Uh, the things, the big thing we didn't realise is how amazing the community we formed. There's a, the two hundred community mm. is really fantastic. As Wendy talked about that, that WhatsApp chat is is pretty awesome. Um, and every mistake we made, boat handling wise, was when I changed when we, but it was really we, me most no, time. We, we changed we. the change the plan. Like we we know how to do a kite drop. We know how to do a jibe. We know how to do a reef. Every time I went off piste and tried to do it a different, quicker way. It had all turned to custard really quickly. So know, know, your, know your routine, stick to your routines and make your routines quicker, but don't try and change the routine in the middle of the race just because you're trying to shave three seconds off a manoeuvre. Take it, take it slow and go well. And Wendy's great at that. She's done, she's done more jobs than I've had hot breakfast, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you should probably listen to Wendy when she says it's a stupid idea. <laughs> That Actually, that, that's probably how I will finish the entire thing. <laughs> Mic drop. Thank you. Questions? Oh, sorry. What else would you like to say? Oh, I love sailing with you. Oh. I think, you know, Campbell and I have known each other for 20 years and I was surprised at how well we sail together. Um, we've done our first Hobart together and now our last Hobart together at the moment. It's true. Um, I think choosing your two-handed buddy is really, really important. Like we're completely different people, which is a good thing, um, and we sort of we do complement each other really, really well. Campbell's strengths were you, he knew the boat so well, he knew the sail plan, what we should do. He did the weather, he did the navigation, um, so we split everything. Even though we talked about everything, that came down to Campbell. I did more steering than him, and it just worked, and we really complimented him. I know he's been really nice to me, so I'm being really nice to him now as well. Thank you. It's freaking, um, you're freaking me out with it. it. It's really important. There was no time when he's down going, you know, and you can't do that. It's just normal sailing, you know. If he's done something that's pissed me off, I'm going to tell him in a nice way. But it never got to that point. <laughs> I'll just say, go, Cam, go sleep. But um, I think that's really important. You've got to learn your boundaries with each other and just respect each other and trust each other. And I trust Camel and he made some different decisions and they were the right decisions. I know he said before he shouldn't have, but it was the right decision. If we'd kept going offshore that first night, we would have broken shit and we would have had to pull out. So his decisions were right. And finally, because he wasn't here when we started, um, thanks, Dad, for giving us the boat and thanks, thanks for the faith Lauren. in us and thanks for all your help. It's been pretty amazing. <laughs> And the support that my whole family and Wendy's family have given us have been has been fantastic. And friends, but, family and friends. And friends. But uh, there is a list there. There is probably three people on that that we've forgotten, as in that aren't there, and they're going to call us in the next forty eight hours. Really sorry, but it's quite a list, huh? And mm. the, and there's everyone there helps we significantly. Got the two community up there. We haven't got the two handed community because they're here. Yeah, Pete Frankie. Thanks, everyone. Pete, Pete Frankie. Frankie. Pete Frankie was always my, hey, Pete, hey, Pete. And we both worked for Pete Frankie when he owned East Cell for many years. So it's like, hey, Pete, hey, Pete. I don't know how many times I've said that, that to you. That is true. So thank you, Pete. You were running down the Derwent in some pretty significant degrees. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what, 25, 30 or something? 25-odd. But if you, look at that, if you look at that first video that we showed the first, that was 15 minutes question. earlier. And it was, oh, sorry. Question is, is that the only kite you used? And that was pretty heavy air you were running in. When we put that kite up, we were in about 10 to 12 knots and it built over 25 minutes to 25. Because it's the Derwin. The question is, what, mm. what weight, what is the weight of that uh, spinnaker as, a, as a, a universal spinnaker you're using? That's a good question. It's an A4, I think it's one. It's quite heavy. It's not 0.9 in the back and I think it's, well, I have to no. check. It's heavier in the front. Right, you, didn't uh, blow, you didn't blow it. Okay. No, I haven't blown it. Um, no. But it's from Ben de Costa and Hoods, and here's that A4. It's pretty much, I know that Craig has a few of them on his um, TP because it's, it is a very sweet design that Ben's come up with as a general, just an all round A4 sale. And we'll, when, when the sponsorship comes in from um, that company that hasn't turned <laughs> up yet, we'll probably get, a, we'll get an A2 made in, in, in a very similar shape. Um, a bit smaller. But again, you you compromise, right? Like I would, I would have had a hundred square meter A2, and then had like an 85 A4, and then an, then a chicken shoot. But when you've only got the budget for one sale, it's never going to be exactly right. But it's pretty. And you right. just got to run with it and suck it up. Yeah, you got to suck it up. <laughs> and so that thing, we can get that, we can keep that flying in about eight and a half knots, and it'll go up to 25s. 
Also very much helps to have, Wendy is really a very good heavy air downwind sailor and, well, and quite seriously, I've, she keeps the boat on its feet far better than I've sailed with some very, very highly paid helmsmen in my time and Wendy is ahead of most of 90% of them. Oh, and I haven't paid her a thing for this endorsement. She <laughs> haven't, have you? Well, actually, I haven't paid she you. She haven't paid me. <laughs> right. So, question. <laughs> Uh, navigation, you mentioned boat stuff. Did, were, were there other roles? You know, how did you demark other roles? Was there, was there a lead on one or right? I tend to go forward, mm. and Wendo tends to drive, run, pit. Um, so I'll do sail changes, Wendo does pit. Um, yeah, that's that's the demark. So something we didn't do that everyone else did is have a one reef line back to the pit, so you can reef one reef from the pit. We're going to do that this year. We will do that for this year. Mm. But for a reef, I go to the mark. We can do we can we can reef in and reef out in like a minute and a half, like less than a minute. Um, but I run forward to the mast and go bang bang, and it's we had marks and we were pretty damn quick. But yeah, I'll I'll do all the I'll do all the yeah. bow stuff, the forwardy stuff, because I'm young. Yeah, <laughs> young, younger. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, so, please. Uh, um, well, you guys can hear me. Yes. All right. Um, considering doing the two-handed, uh, how much? What training regimen would you recommend for people that have done mostly full cruise um, sailing? Where do you do two around the world, so start there. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but personally, get as fit as you possibly can. Um, like, it takes a lot out of you to hand steer. For, if you're on watch for two or three, you know, two hours, which then when you do a changeover, it might end up being, you know, two and a half, three hours, and you're steering for that. You need to be strong, so get as fit as you possibly can physically. Training, do as many manoeuvres as you can. Work out what works on your boat and don't. So we'd go out and we'd have marks around the, you know, on the harbour and go, okay, we're going to go around here and put a kite up or down. And we'd take our kites down with short runways, so we put the pressure on and get it down quick. So just that practising to see what works with just two people is really important. Campbell mentioned it earlier that when we'd get the kite up, we'd always take the, the lazy sheet through the boom, through a block and have it set up for two purposes, if we need to drop it quickly or if we have an MOB, which we need to drop it quickly for. So that was part of our training as well, to set up for a jibe, take it out, get the sheet back around as quick as you can if you need a jibe. So. When you're pushing hard on big boats for the crew, you do not think of the worst case scenario. Mm. You vaguely occasionally step out of like the, the bite of a rope and think, well, that would have sucked if that block had a blown. Mm. But for us, I find you're constantly in a state of what's the worst thing that's going to happen right now and how can I avoid that? Um, as far as training, I lost 15 kilograms. I got on the bike and went really, oh, we did the first couple of things and I was just, I wasn't fit enough. And I, I got on the push bike and lost 15 kilograms. Wendo went to the personal trainer and you lost like 10, you yeah, lost a lot. You got fit. Maybe about she got, the lady got guns. <laughs> um, but we, 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 after the first, our first couple of forays, we suddenly realised that we were not fit enough to do this. Um, so mm. that was a big part of it for me. And, and, and it could, good reason to go to the gym, or not go to the gym, but get on the bike and actually go mm. get out there. But as far as training, we went out every week for, I don't know, 15, 20 weeks? Yeah, we, we did a fair bit. And we wouldn't just go out and do, and that's why when we did that race with the other two Hannah guys, that we were going up to Bird Isle and we just said, we're not going to learn just by steering a straight line on a beam reach, let's, or, or close reach, let's do something. So, and that's what we stopped and did, and that's more important. So, you know, the racing's important to see how you're going against other bows, but we needed to, do some safety training, see what we're going to work, what's going to work, what's not going to work. So that's get really our, Get our manoeuvres right. Mm. Um, we, I think we needed to, we planned quite well what we were going to do whenever we went out. We would have gave, we <laughs> when it planned, when we planned well, it went well, when we didn't plan it. Just it didn't go well, <laughs> yeah. True. Mm. There's something in that, I don't know what. <laughs> cool. Can anyone build? So... Where do you see two-handed in the next two, five years yeah, out of Sydney? East oh, it's huge. It's a big question, I know. It's getting bigger, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's so... It's it's a more rewarding way to go sailing. Mm. It's also a more exhausting way to go sailing. But 
it's also the, an affordable option. Um, we, yeah. we, we've done this on a shoestring budget on a, on a borrowed boat and we, we've managed to make it work. And I think lots of other people are gonna do the same thing because it is infinitely rewarding to get to, get to Hobart, um, to, to call my wife and to call my dad when we got there. It's probably as emotional a, a, a conversation I've had with anyone in a long, long time. Did you get pretty teary? Mine was very teary. <laughs> um, and I think, like, people that have sailed on big boats for a long time, there's always a struggle to get decent crew. And, you know, if you're on a TP, you can't just get anyone out the bar and go for a sail. You need to have, you know, good crew. And it's getting harder and harder. There's more and more boats. So I think we're going to start going backwards a bit and getting smaller boats, you know. And it is just such an awesome... Awesome group, isn't it, Pete and Drew down there? It's just it's just fantastic. The two Hannah group is awesome. I would imagine twenty five out of a hundred boats this year for Hobart without I think that's mm. pretty much a given. And I think it'd be closer to thirty. But I don't know, who knows? It um yeah. We're sort sort of organising that as we go. So Green boat, what would you JPK. JPK. <laughs> JPK 1040. JPK, yeah, JPK. No, actually, there's a Beneteau um, 1036 coming. Oh, yeah, sorry. Beneteau 1036. <laughs> Looks pretty sexy. Beneteau 1036. Beneteau 1036. Now. I, I sell, if you'd like to buy one, come Campbell and sell. Campbell sells Beneteaus. Uh, the Beneteau 1036 is a sad manoir design, and it looks pretty amazing. I've always said a JPK 1040. Mm. I think that's a very, for, because um, he, he sells them in the French, they, I mean, the 1010 is the boat that won Fastnet. Or, or for me personally, Class 40. There's a Class 40 two-handed race around the world next year, starting in September. I'd love to do that. I need a Class 40. Yeah, but I talked to Rupert about the Class 40, and Rupert is a very fit man. He's like, I'm having, I'm, it's yeah. a big boat. It's a lot of boat. <laughs> and I, I think I'm going to leave that to him. Yeah, I wouldn't have a scale. I wouldn't have a scale bow. I'd go for old. No, old anyway. Mm. Anyhow. Cool. Pete! 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 Pete. How do you feel about the uh, the advent of the new uh, French class of boat, like the Genoa 3300 with the two rudders and uh, building bits and pieces? How do you feel uh, your boat will compete against? Uh, <sighs> it's going to be tough, isn't it? Budget, uh, smaller two-handed programs. We, well, I mean, <laughs> we're racing the J99s, which is the equivalent. We, we beat one and got smashed by the other one. Um, I think the 3300s may could may well be the TP52 of two-handed sailing in that they just will win everything in every condition and there's not much you can do about it. We just turn up and smile and but none of them have no one got through the first night of Hobart so we'll see what happens when they get their, get themselves together. Mm. They're coming and they're going to be good um, and we shall see. Um, but I mean, what can you say? It's like asking somebody who has a forty, a, a, a good forty footer, what they think about the TPs that win everything yeah. every week. It's like it's not a level playing field. It never has been, never will be. But you've got to sail along in the boat that you've got. And um, I mean, if you want to get rid of Drew and buy one, I'll come sailing with you, Pete. I'm, <laughs> I'm keen. Sign me up. When do I drive the chase boat? I'm going to be So. Um. <coughs> Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Campbell. Um, two questions here. I was about to ask you next, next campaigns, but I guess you just revealed something. I'm but out. I I'm, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are your next campaigns? And the second one is how do you see that the CYC as a club can uh, best help with an offshore academy approach to train well rounded, all round sailors able to step up to this 200 program? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the question was how can the CYC help get younger people into offshore sailing? Is that my yeah. correct interpretation? The um, word offshore academy type program was uttered the phrase. I mean, it's tough. If you go overseas, you've got all these wonderful academies, the old um, Artemis that was in the UK that was for younger people to get into offshore racing. It's hard. I don't think we have the funds and the, the numbers here that you do in the UK or in France. You know, you go to France and sailors are rock stars over there. So. I guess we just got to keep encouraging people. I, and there's been some pushback that if there's going to be bigger two-handed, it's going to be harder for younger people to come in through sailing to get in two-handed. But I don't know, just keep doing what you're doing, getting out there on dinghies. The academy here is awesome. That's what Campbell came through, the sailing academy. I was in the first generate, first year of the youth sailing academy in 92 or 93. Um, uh, in answer to your question, what's next for us, 
we're not going to be able to do Southport because I've got other commitments, but we will do the Blue Water and then on to um, Hobart again, and then we'll look at the program at the other side. There's some we've trying to organise some races with the CYC, and we're working with the guys at um, RPAYC. They've got a really nice second half of the year two-handed um, calendar, and we're working with a couple of clubs to put together um, um, a, a proper season. So thank you everyone for coming down and listening. I hope you got something out of this. I, I have, but I'm booted off the team. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Campbell. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>